Gary Smalley, and it's a privilege of mine to introduce this new video series, So You're Getting Married. It's by my good friend, Norm Wright. Now, I've known Norm for over 20 years, and I can say without question that he's one of the finest pre-marriage counselors in the world. And he's assembled a Super Bowl team of Christian counselors that team teach this series with him. People like Howard Hendricks, John Trent, Jean Elaine Getz, Carl Burkeen, Paul Faulkner, Cliff and Joyce Penner, Gary Oliver, Dennis Rainey, E.V. Hill, Steve Otterburn, and Frank Minner. Segments one and two talk about the reasons why you marry. Segment three is on commitment. Segment four teaches you how to keep your marriage vibrant. Segment five gives you the keys to a lasting marriage. Segment six faces the hard truth that marriage is a refining process. Segment seven discusses intimacy. Segments eight and nine teach us how to communicate, while 10 and 11 give us something to communicate about, that's money. And finally, segments 12 and 13 talk about the exciting but sometimes difficult subject of sex. And now as an overview, uh, here are some of the things that we've found in the minds of people just like you, and Norm addresses these challenges in the series. You know, one thing that really scares me is a divorce rate in this country. I'm looking forward to getting married here shortly. But man, I tell you, that's something that I don't want to be a part of, is divorce. I know a lot of Christian people that are getting divorced left and right, and I simply don't want to be a part of that. I want to safeguard my marriage, protect my family, love my wife, and have a happy and a long-lasting marriage. Commitment is an act of the will. It's a pledge. It's not a sentencing, but it's a privilege. And if we look at it in that way, that this is a privilege to be committed to you regardless of whatever happens in the relationship. And there is that word, regardless. Commitment is not a contract. A contract is based on, okay, if you do such and such, and if you follow through with this, then I will go ahead and follow through with my part of it. That doesn't work here. And the other problem with a contract, a con contract has an escape clause. If you don't come through, I can bail out. Commitment is just saying, this is it. I am yours for life. No hesitation, no questions, regardless of what occurs. I've been hurt many times by by guys because they don't understand who I am or how I communicate. And because I don't understand how how their language works and how they try to communicate things. As I look towards getting married, it's even more frustrating because I want to be able to understand my husband and I want him to be able to understand me. I am scared about the physical aspect of my relationship. As I look towards my honeymoon, I am worried about the desires that may or may not be there. But it's encouraging to know that sex is a gift from God and as we look to him as a couple, he will let it turn out the way it's supposed to. As a man in the area of sex, there were certain needs that I felt needed to be met. However, when I, I realized that with Bernie, uh, just to, m putting my arms around her and hugging her was, was many times all the affection, all that she needed. And I needed to realize that when I did put my arms around her, not to expect anything else in, uh, in return. Men and women are different in many ways, including sexually. And one of the first things we need to realize is that sex is not man's idea. It is God's idea. It's his creation. Now, you under have to understand these male-female differences, especially when it comes to sex. We men, we experience arousal and, and climax with relative ease. As Gary Smalley says, we're like a microwave. We just, boom, turn on just like that. Women are a little different. Sometimes 
when it comes to the sexual response, they liken them to a crock pot, a slow simmering building up. And if men would ever realize this, I deal with men in my office who've been married for 20 years, and they say, I just can't understand my wife. And I get ready for bed and say, okay, let's have sex. <laughs> oh, that's real romantic, Fred. <laughs> just doesn't work that way. My wife and I have had some uh, conflict with money, and we've had some difficulty trying to figure out where money should go and that. And I think it's real important that I, as a person, stop and listen to her and allow her to uh, view, give her views on money. Uh, let her spend some money sometimes. I, the conflict arises when I feel that she doesn't need to know about certain things or where money is going. And I think it's real, real important that you allow your wife to know where money is going, where it's set, and what kind of policies you do have. So I'm saying to myself that, uh, uh, I need to allow her some independence with her spending. I grew up in the projects, the oldest of eight children. Both my parents had to work, and with both those incomes, money was still tight. We always had enough to eat and clothes on our back, but very little for the extras. So from a very young child, I had some very set ideas about money and finances. I saw some conflicts that it caused in my parents, and it frightened me. And then when Jan and I got together, his background was totally different. And it was frustrating for me that he didn't understand just where I was coming from and the fears that I had about money. What's the first major argument that you're going to have during the first six months of marriage? And I get all sorts of responses back, some of it based on what we talked about in the counseling. But uh, some of the research studies show that money is the leading cause of argument during the first year. When you come into a marriage, what is yours, what is mine, it is brought together. There's got to be that investment of trust. There is a risk, but that's what marriage is all about. You know, one of the things I'm convinced is that if my wife and I would have had this video series before we married, I mean, it would have catapulted our relationship into a much more intimate and loving one sooner. And the one thing I really appreciate about this video series is that it's interactive. Uh, Norm gives you a workbook and other resources, and then from time to time, he's going to stop the tape, which allows you to discuss the information. Now, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to stop your tape and turn to the workbook, because in the workbook, you're going to find a couple of things. One is a suggested daily log and family log history where you're going to be asked to keep track of what you do for several days, sort of maybe in five and ten minute increments. Uh, what do you do is first thing when you get up, what's the next thing you do? What's the next thing you do? And what do you do all day long? And then you'll have the opportunity to compare your daily activities. Because some of you are going to say, well, why would you take a shower first thing when you get up? Why don't you wait until after you have breakfast like I do? Well, you're going to find out how different you are. You have to learn to mesh. You have to learn to share the bathroom, for one thing. And then there's a list of about 50 to 60 interview questions for you to ask your fiancé. You might think that you know them now, but I think you'll find by asking them these questions that you're going to gain more knowledge about them <coughs> than you ever had before. And that'll help you learn to adjust. One of the best things about this series is that it's biblical. And Norm gives key insights into God's word. Sex is good in God's sight. Scriptures talk about that. Sex for pleasure is approved of. Did you know that? In fact, back in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5, it says, When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and shall cheer his wife whom he has taken. Now, the word cheer his wife, I think you catch the meaning of what that's all about there. We also know that in the scripture, sex play is recognized as normal in the scriptures. In chapter 26 of Genesis, Isaac went to a different land, and there was a king there by the name of Abimelech. And what Isaac did, because he was afraid for his life, was to tell them that this woman, my wife, is actually my sister. She was really beautiful, she was attractive, and he thought, everybody's going to want her, so they'll just do me in, so I'll just say, hey, she's my sister. 
Well, it says in verse 8, When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw Isaac sporting with Rebekah, his wife. The original word sporting means caressing. It's the foreplay leading up to sexual intercourse. So the Word of God is pretty open and pretty direct about this. One thing is very important to remember about this series is it's very personal. And Norm shares intimately about his own life as a counselor, as a husband, and as a father. In life, problems are inevitable. Joy is an option. It is a choice. Well, the big event we had in our life was our second child, Matt. Matthew was born, looked to be a very healthy boy, and after several weeks, Joyce, being more insightful than me, noticed that he was not developing fully physically. His eyes didn't track with us. And she pointed it out to me and asked me if I'd noticed it, and I said no, and I looked, and she was right. But as all parents, we said, well, look, he's just a little slower in development. He's going to catch up. Well, this went on week after week, month after month. And then the grand mal seizures began. And they continued, and that's when we put Matthew under the care of the neurologist. And after several weeks of treatment, or not treatment, but evaluation, we were called in. And I'll never forget the doctor saying, the best way to explain it to you, it's like his brain did not form properly, and that accounts for the severity of the mental retardation. And at birth, for some reason, there was brain damage, which accounts for the seizures. The best thing I can tell you is that Matthew someday might become a two-year-old mentally. But then again, he might not. And one of the things I had to learn was to become more fully human. I was like most men. I didn't share my feelings. I didn't talk about them, didn't show them much, didn't know how to. I mean, who had ever taught me a feeling vocabulary? Nobody. And so, I did not cry for my son right away. It took 10 months before I ever cried for his condition. And when it happened, I could not cry in front of my wife. And on the morning of March 15th, the Ides of March, the doctors called and said, you need to be here as soon as possible. And that's all he said, but we knew. And we walked in and the doctor said, in the next hour, Matthew's heart and lungs are going to stop. And there was such an incredible mixture of loss and pain mixed with joy, as expressed by what my wife's first comment to the doctor was, you mean this is the day that Matthew will be in the presence of Jesus? Yes. A Christian doctor said, yes, he'll be there today. And so we said goodbye to Matthew. And within an hour, our son was in the presence of Jesus. And at the memorial service where our pastor, Dr. Ogilvie, shared, he said, Matthew doesn't walk funny anymore. He can run. Matthew doesn't just have a few words. He's got thousands of words. That was Matthew's healing. And you know, Matthew's presence in our life is how God has caused us to create our mission statement to minister to others. Because we have people and couples that call all the time that have disabled children or they've lost a child in death. And that's how God is using that as he used us. But one last thought about this. Two weeks after Matthew died, I got a hold of a book by my favorite author, Max Lucado, called The Applause of Heaven. And I did something I just hate when I hear other people doing it. I went to the last chapter, and I read it first, because I'd heard about it. And in that chapter, Max is telling how he comes back to the airport, and his wife and three children will be there, his three little girls. And one little girl does something really strange. Instead of jumping up and down, she sees her father and starts applauding. Well, in this last chapter, Max goes on to describe what it's going to be like when we go home to be with the Lord. And he gives a beautiful description of it and talks about Revelation 21. And in the last paragraph, he says, when you go home to be with the Lord and you walk into that city, 
you will be seeing many people there that you know. And there will be the throngs and the crowds to welcome you. But in the back, behind the crowd, there will be one who will take his nail-pierced hands from beneath his robe. And when he sees you coming into heaven, he will begin to applaud. That's what I saw happening when my son Matthew went into the presence of Jesus. Count it all joy, my brethren. God will work in your life. This is just a small taste of what you're going to get as you go through this video series, So You're Getting Married. And I'm confident that as you go through this series, you're going to come out so much better equipped to face the challenges of marriage. Let me pray for you right now, would you? I'd love to do that and dedicate your marriage to the Lord because you and I both know we need His strength if we're going to be able to do this like God wants us to. Our Heavenly Father, I just thank you right now for these couples. I pray, Lord, your richest blessing in their life, on their marriage, on their families, Lord. And I pray, Father, as you encourage them and enrich them, they eventually will glorify your name. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and Lord bless you. Two critical ingredients for the success of the So You're Getting Married video series are the His and Her workbooks that are essential to the pre-marriage counseling contained in this series. These workbooks are available through your local church. about to embark on a journey, an incredible journey called marriage. The better prepared you are, the more you will enjoy the trip. And I don't know of a more qualified person than Norm Wright to take you on that journey, to give you the direction that you need. Have a great experience. Now we're going to be talking about the adventure called marriage. And it's interesting, when you think about marriage, uh, let, me, let me use a couple of illustrations. I doubt if anybody watching has really gone on a safari, but you've heard about them. I've read about them in National Geographic. And when people go on a safari, that's sort of the, the end result. I mean, they spend months preparing. They go through the maps. They check out the different guides. They get all the equipment together, whether it's a hunting safari with guns or whether it's with photography. They want to make sure that they have everything that they need so that when they get there, it's going to be successful. Well, I think we do the same thing with our vocations. We look forward to working in a certain profession. Um, my son-in-law is a fireman. I mean, he went to college for it. He worked at other jobs as a firefighter until he could really get to that position. He spent years preparing, and all of us do. But when it comes to marriage, very few people put in the amount of time that is needed to make their marriage fruitful make it satisfying, make it all that they want it to be. I know in the state in which I reside, most people put in more time preparing to get their driver's license than they ever do, you know, to work on marriage. Well, that's what this series is all about. And it's interesting because this is called So You're Getting Married. But as I look around the group here, a number of you are already married. Some of you have been married just a few years, some of you over 20 years. And even though this material is being directed toward those who are just beginning their adventure of marriage, we find that married couples are going to be using this same material as well because it's applicable to them no matter what stage they're at in their marriage. And you know something that's happening in our country that is really fascinating? More and more couples are wanting to renew their marriage vows. They're wanting to make a new and fresh commitment. I've participated in some of those remarriage ceremonies with couples who are maybe just getting back together after a separation or couples whose marriages have been just going along fine, but they're saying, you know, we never really had a, a real marriage or we really never fully prepared. We want to go through a preparation time. And we're finding that 
classes and churches are doing this classes will take this material maybe there's six or eight or ten couples or maybe there's forty or fifty couples and they will all go through this together and then at the end of this as a class they will go together pool some money have the church all arranged have flowers have some uh, goodies there and have the passages there and then as a group come in and repeat their wedding vows to one another Sometimes the couples will write out their own and, and have them very special, or it will be sort of a, a blanket wedding vow where everybody will participate in that. And it's a time where they can invite their friends, other relatives, even having their own children to come in and see, this is what mom and dad went through many years ago. It's really a delightful time. And this series is something that can really help you renew those vows, renew the marriage relationship, take a look at it. And the focus in this is not pointing out problems. The focus is on pointing out the positives and making the marriage all that you really want it to be because that's the way that marriages grow is where you pay attention to what's going well and not so much attention to what isn't going well. And when you do look at what isn't going well, look at it in such a way that you can turn it around and change it so it begins moving forward in a positive way. And this is why premarital counseling is so essential. This is the type of experience that can make all the difference in the world. In fact, we know from the research that couples who go through extensive premarital counseling, they are able to weather the storms of marriage far better and the divorce rate is cut down significantly. One of the things I've found happening in uh, premarital counseling that all of you need to know about is that often I have couples who will go all the way through premarital counseling and then make the decision that, you know, I don't think that marriage is for us. That's a wise decision on their part. I've kept track over the last few years and of the last 58 couples that I've worked with, 22 of them actually decided not to get married. And in only two or three cases did I have to bring it up. Most of them said, you know, we're really feeling kind of uncomfortable with this. And then I would go ahead and start drawing out more information. And some of them said, I think we'd better put the relationship on hold. In fact, I can remember one couple where we went through all the premarital counseling and everything really seemed to be working well. And two weeks before the wedding, there was a regret card that was sent out. And it was simply because the woman realized that she really didn't fully love this man, but believed that after I'm married, that love is going to come about. You've really got to know and be convinced ahead of time that this person I really love. You may be involved in premarital counseling and discover that you're moving in the wrong direction in terms of your prospective mate. And I would encourage you to make a decision that will determine your destiny. It's much better to break an engagement than to break a marriage. One of the reasons that I believe so strongly in premarital counseling is that over the years I've seen what it can do. And see, when you go through premarital counseling, part of our goal is to help you eliminate as many surprises as possible. Because once you get married, you're going to begin discovering some things that you never dreamed of. Well, if we can bring those out now, put them on the table, talk about them, and begin working through that adjustment process, it's going to be so much better. Um, one of the things that we usually do in premarital is to identify the major problem areas. It doesn't mean that we eliminate them. But when you go in knowing that, OK, this is something that we'll probably have some conflicts over. We're aware of it. It's not going to throw us. But we've also started to learn some skills. One of my frustrations as a marriage counselor is to have couples come in who've been married for 15 years, and you know what they say? Norm, it's not that we haven't talked about this problem. We've been talking about it for 15 years. We just never get it resolved. Well, I know that you want to go into a marriage so that you can have it resolved and you can reduce the frustration level. You want enjoyment. You want satisfaction. You want joy in that relationship. And so one of the things that I'm going to work on doing 
is to bring a different level of realism into your relationship. Not to destroy the romance that's there. That's a very important part of a relationship, and you want to cultivate that. And by doing this, we hope, and we've seen this happen, that couples will have the marriages that they want because now the dreams can be very realistic. Sometimes they're not always realistic. Premarital counseling does not cause the romance to evaporate. It just makes it much more realistic. When you come into a marriage, you have a picture of your ideal partner, but you marry a real person. So your only option is you either tear up the picture or you tear up the person. I believe one of the greatest contributions of premarital counseling is that it brings a note of realism into the relationship. Now you marry a person that you know and therefore are convinced, God wants me to marry this person. And people, when they come into my office, usually ask, okay, Norm, how much work is entailed in all this? Well, to be very broad about it, think about this premarital experience like a three-unit graduate course. There will be that much work. I usually let people know that you're going to be doing about 50 to 70 hours of homework because of the tests that will be involved, because of the uh, books that you'll be reading, and because of the interaction. That's what's critical, is where you take the questions that you've answered, and you sit there face to face as a couple, and you talk back and forth. And you know, one of the things that we've learned over the years that when couples are talking, even at home, after they're married, if you hold hands, it keeps a lid on the emotions a lot better. You don't overreact, because that sense of touch reminds you who the person is that you've committed your life to and who you're connected with. Now, let me just tell you a bit about the test. You might want to go back to your pastor and ask about a couple of them. One of them is provided for you in the kit that you really need for this premarital experience. But one of the tests is the Taylor-Johnson temperament analysis. And it talks about nine different traits, some of which are very essential for discovering who you are and how you mesh. Now, we've been able to find over the years that that test can actually indicate which couples are going to have the most difficulty in working together and which ones are going to discover that this is going to be a lot easier. In the kit that you're going to be using that's containing the books and resources, there's a tool called the Family History Analysis. And you will be completing that in detail if you already haven't completed it. And it will help you do an analysis of your relationship with your mother and one of your father, and then with the siblings if there were some there. And then it will talk about the home, whether it was what we call a functional background or a dysfunctional background, and it will help you identify the goals that you have for the future. And based on that, you might discover some issues that need additional attention, either in talking with your fiancé or in talking with the pastor of the church. Because we know that when couples have emotionally separated from their parents in a healthy way, that is one of the criteria that is used for depicting whether a marriage is going to be fulfilling or not. If you come into a marriage with leftover residue, with hurts, resentments, difficulties, then it's like a third party in the marriage that interferes in the relationship. And all of a sudden, later on, you begin reacting to your partner saying, you sound just like my mother. Or that's just what my father would say. I didn't want to marry my father. And all of a sudden, <laughs> uh oh, we got some new things to deal with here. Now, let me just go through with you the, um, some of the resources that you're going to be using. Uh, the main text for this series is called, So You're Getting Married. And you'll be reading this, and you'll be interacting with this and discussing this. It'll give you a lot of content, a lot of things to really think about, and hopefully some material that you haven't thought of before. A second resource that you'll be using is called Before You Say I Do. Now, in this resource, it's filled 
with a lot of blank space where you have to write out the answers. But you know what's so important? Not that you've written it out, but that you sit together and say, OK, here's how I answered this. How did you answer it? And this is the resource that will help to eliminate a lot of the surprises from your relationship. We've gone to a couple of books by Gary Smalley, and most people have heard about Gary. In fact, uh, when I was a Christian ed director at a church, there was a Baptist church near me that had this young intern working there by the name of Gary Smalley. So we've known each other for almost uh, 30 years now. There is a book for the wives called For Better or For Best, and a book for the men called If Only He Knew. Recently, uh, a couple came back in after reading these books, and uh, the young man came in, and he was holding the book like this and said, Norm, I bought three of these to give to my buddies. And I said, you guys have got to read this book and really know how to treat your wife. Boy, he was just really adamant about this. But he learned some things in here that he had never learned before. And then something that is very important that everybody's interested in, the subject of sex. And this is a very recent book by Cliff and Joyce Penner, who are the two top Christian sex therapists in the country. And when I got this book and read through it, I said, yes, why wasn't this written 20 years ago? It is so complete and thorough. And we do encourage you to read the books together, to stop reading, to talk about them, and learn from them. Because we live in a society that has sex as a very common term. It's a very sexually oriented society, but still very ignorant of what it's all about. When we come into marriage, we got to realize we have married a foreigner. They have their own dictionary. I mean, you can use the two, same two words, but there's a different meaning to them. And you look at the other person and say, how come you take four sentences to say something? And you look at the other one and say, how come you take three words to say something? And that can be a major conflict in marriage. Hopefully, all this material is going to reduce that. And sometimes people say, you know, that sounds like a lot of money. Well, in reality, the amount charged for the kit is very minimal. And when you put it in perspective with what you're spending on flowers, photographs, the goodies to eat at the reception, which are gobbled up literally in a half hour, and you spent $500, you know, what is spent for premarital counseling is the best marriage insurance that you will ever have. One of the reasons why marriages disintegrate is inadequate preparation. You know, we take out insurance for our car, for our home, for our life. But unfortunately, the most important of human relations, we invest no insurance. And I believe that premarital counseling can be the best insurance that you can take. It's the kind of insurance that will guarantee an effective marriage. So that sort of gives you the, um, the overview of what premarital is like. And um, why don't I just go ahead now and just start pl plunging in and talking about some of the things that I would talk about if you were just an individual couple in session with me. You know, marriage is one of the greatest adventures that you and I can ever engage in. My wife and I have been married for over 35 years. And when we got married, I don't think we were really that prepared. We had one session of premarital. I wish we'd had six or 10 sessions like I usually engage in with couples. So we had an awful lot to learn about and a lot of surprises right away. For example, three months after we were married, my wife became ill and couldn't work anymore, and we were in the midst of graduate school. And so we lived on our disability payments for the first year, and then I started a painting business and worked, put us through, then went on staff of a church, then a baby was born, and you know, one thing after another. And so when you look back, you wish, boy, if I'd known all this then. That's what we're going to be doing in premarital. What I want to share is what we have learned over 35 years, what I have learned from hundreds of couples in marriage counseling, and I have taken all that material, and I've tried to compact it 
to present it to you now so you don't have to wait 10, 15, or 20 years to learn about this. Because if you can go into marriage with certain skills and certain procedures, and you know, OK, this can be a difficult spot in marriage, such as seven years. For some reason, around seven years, there's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of divorces that occur. If you can prepare for that ahead of time, you'll handle it so much better. Now, speaking of divorce, we know we live in a society where there are so many divorces. I guess the question I have for all of you is this. In light of all these divorces, why is it that your marriage is going to be different? Why won't your marriage end up in divorce? I'm going to ask you to stop the tape at this time, and just the two of you together, or if you're in a group, as twos, talk about this together. That question might have been a difficult one for you to answer. But let me tell you what I often hear. Many times, couples will come back and say, well, we're Christians. That's why we're not going to get a divorce. Or they would say, well, we really love one another. All right, but what kind of love is it? I usually send the couples home with a written assignment to come back with their plan as to why their marriage is going to stay together because there needs to be some sort of a plan. And it's when you anticipate ahead of time that, uh, as I call it, termites could get into the, um, into the uh, marriage and begin devouring it in a very subtle way. If you've been fumigated and protected against this, inoculated, then it's not going to happen. So it's really important that you spend time thinking about, OK, this is why our marriage is going to make it. There are reasons why some marriages survive and others fail. In the first place, I would suggest that often we make unwise choices. That is, we choose to marry an individual that we really do not know. The relationship is very superficial. It's almost like playing Russian roulette. But also, I think many marriages fail because we have unrealistic expectations. We expect marriage to do what only God can do. Let's never forget we're marrying a person. And every person has limitations. All of us are sinners. And therefore, we need the realism that our evaluation brings to the relationship. Now, one of the questions I always ask my couples to write out ahead of time before they come in is to give me 10 indications as to why this is the time of their life to marry and 12 specific reasons why they want to marry the other person. In your workbook, you're going to find a place for you to do that as a homework assignment where you need to come up with at least 10 indications as to why now is the time to marry. I mean, why not last year? Why not three years from now? Why is it you, you set your date? And then 12 specific reasons as to why you want to marry that other person. And it's going to be important that after you have written these out, that you share them face to face with one another. I have a number with me that I've uh, saved from some couples that I thought you might be interested in. Uh, this was from a young man as to why this is the time of my life. I honestly believe that Mary is the lady God would have me to marry and feel the reasons to wait have been exhausted. God can use my life more effectively as a married man. History shows me that any man's life is enhanced by marrying the right woman at the right time. And then he said, I have become good friends with my mother and father and feel it's time to leave and cleave. <laughs> and then a very choice one. My God-given sexual desires are fully ripened. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then one fellow who had sort of a subtle, droll sense of humor. Just a likable guy. Um, Ten reasons to marry in this, at this time, in no particular order. And here's just four of them. I have grown tired of the endless process and pressures of pursuing relationships. I want to focus my energies toward other ends. 
I want to establish myself professionally, religiously, emotionally, and domestically. I feel it's best to establish a personal relationship before making career decisions, which I will be making in the next 18 months. Boy, he's very logical, got everything down to a T. And then, <laughs> I want to raise children. For some time, I felt unqualified to raise children, but have concluded I can do a better job than most people I've met. <laughs> and then, you know, sometimes, I just laugh with him in, in the session. I just, if it's funny, I'm gonna laugh. It's too hard to keep a straight face. And he was sitting there with a straight face reading some of these. I believe that God intends for me to marry at this time. Although I have always admired the single, independent, self-reliant, super successful male as an ideal, I have concluded that that is not the type of person God intends for me to be. Too bad, but mine is not to question why. So, <laughs> so you can tell we had a lot of fun with this person. You know, when you write your reasons, Keep in mind that as you share your reasons with the other person, you're sharing part of your value system. You're saying to that individual, that person you're going to marry, these values are important to me. And you're also saying to them that the reasons that I want to marry you, some of them have to do with who you are as a person. I never want you to change from being that person. There is a message there. And what I would encourage you to do with your reasons is to type them out, put them in maybe an acetate, and keep them in a very special place so that on your first wedding anniversary, which you make super special, you take the reasons out and you look at your, now your spouse, and say, well, here were the reasons that I wanted to marry you, and you share those with them again. And now you add, here are the additional reasons why I'm glad that I've married you that I've discovered in this first year. And you keep doing this every year and make it a tradition so that you never have to question, why did I marry you in the first place? And one other suggestion to you that has come back to me from some of my couples, they took the reasons, incorporated some of those into the wedding service so that all the people who were there would have an idea of why they were making this commitment. That's why the timing and the reasons are very important to consider. I think I would say that there are three keys to a quality marriage. They certainly have been in ours for 47 years. The first is commitment. The realization that there is no way out. And therefore, we're willing to work out the problems. Good marriages and poor marriages face exactly the same problems. The difference is one of commitment. But I would also say that communication is absolutely critical. You see, there's no problem that you cannot solve if you are willing to communicate. Communication is not an option. It's an essential. You need to talk about everything. And then conflict resolution has been an incredibly valuable tool for my wife and me. Because if you have two imperfect people, two sinners in a relationship, they obviously are going to make mistakes. They're going to annoy each other. Therefore, you need some practical means of solving that conflict. And if you have that practical means, the relationship is secure.